Hello everyone, my name is John Hammond, and in this video, we're going to be taking a look at some of the challenges from the GuidePoint Security CTF, or the Capture the Flag event that was running this past week. So I am connected to their VPN, I'm logged in on the scoreboard at 10, 10, 100, 100, and I can hop on over to the challenges. So I want to release a couple of videos showcasing these different challenges. We have some network machines that we can take advantage of, and we also have a simple challenge here that doesn't really fit in any other category. There is, of course, a sanity check challenge that is just a simple, hey, copy and paste the flag. You can go ahead, slap that in and get your 100 points. But in this video, I want to showcase the Jeffrey box. And that is located at this IP address, 101022. And if I open up this first challenge here, it says Jeffrey is a network device hosted at that IP address. Your goal is to enumerate this device like you would in a penetration test. That means you can run Nmap, Nikto, Durbuster, Metasploit, etc. And there are multiple flags on this challenge. You need to submit each one in their respective challenge card as we can see on the CTFD board. This challenge is for Jeffrey 1. You will still target that same IP address for the next set of the flags. The flags may be found in different locations like source code, flag.txt files, and others. So let's go ahead and start to attack this box now that we have all that information set. So I'm going to hop over to my terminal and I already have a directory created here. I'm going to be working for this specific CTF. And again, this is a rolling CTF. They're going to be doing a one week game for like the next couple of months. So it's super duper fun. You should jump in. And uh, we've got this Jeffrey directory and folder created. Let's make an nmap directory so we can store our nmap scans. And I'll go ahead and kickstart an nmap scan with default or safe scripts, tack on to output to a specific directory and format here with the nmap format, tack sv to enumerate versions. And of course the IP address, which we know is 10.10.22. So I can slap that in and Nmap will go ahead and run. Now when Nmap does this with the default kind of settings here, you aren't specifying any specific ports to enumerate, it'll look through the most common 1000. We can see that 22 or SSH, that port is open and accessible. It looks like we've got the version as we've specified in our TAC SV parameter and flag there. And we have it running on a new Ubuntu server. That means we're, we know we're working on Linux here. We also have port 80 open or HTTP for a web server. And it looks like that is hosted with Apache. And the title, as we can see through our scripts, is simply Jeffrey. So we could start to enumerate this. SSH on port 22, that's normally going to take command line and console access. But we need credentials to be able to log in. We don't have credentials yet, so we'll have to enumerate that port 80. Now I mentioned though, Nmap is only going to scan the like most common 1000 ports, but there are 65,535 possible and potential ports. So we could kick this off with a larger Nmap scan saying TAC be TAC. And then if we're going to go across all those ports, we might as well go all the way and use a TAC capital A flag to be aggressive and scan for just about everything that we can, what Nmap knows how to do. That is aggressive and will make a lot of noise. And maybe we don't need to do that across every single port. We can kind of trim that down and actually just use Rust scan. I really, really like Rust Scan. It's going to use Rust to make the scanning process much, much faster. It'll look through all of the like 65,535 ports first. And then the ones that it finds, it'll pass that to Nmap, and Nmap will then be aggressive on those specific ports. So you can install Rust Scan if you'd like to. You can do some Googling, and I'm running it as a Docker image in this case, but you just simply run Rust Scan if you set up the alias and pass in the IP address. So if I were to simply slap that in, it sees port 22 and port 80 open as we saw earlier, but it also sees a new port, 58008. So let's go explore that because we don't exactly know what it is, and we should also take a look at that web server on port 80. So we've got the IP address, I can open it in my browser, and we're greeted with just this Jeffrey. And we've got a little meme GIF here. Who could be scared of a Jeffrey? Nice. Uh, I can right click and like view page source or hit control U on my keyboard. And zooming in on this, we don't really have anything here other than bare bones classic HTML. It doesn't look like there are any secrets. Oh, actually scrolling, I'm using my horizontal scroll bar to move all the way to the to the side here, we are seeing one flag, Storm CTF Jeffrey 1, and 
some simple hash value we could copy and paste. There we go. That is one flag. That is our first flag. And we could simply submit that just by viewing the source of the HTML. That's a good practice, a good thing to do because they might hide things from us. There might be HTML comments that leave behind developer notes or anything like that. It's always a good practice to view the source of the web page. We could see this if we were to run this with like curl or use a command line tool to get the request information and not have it just rendered out in our browser because Firefox or Chrome is going to read and interpret this HTML, CSS, JavaScript. But if we want that raw data, just viewing the source and looking around being, I don't know, a little more intrusive, just, hey, let's examine everything that we can see here. That's a, a good thing to do. There's our first flag, but... There aren't any other links on this page, so there doesn't seem to be anything interesting that we could poke around. But that doesn't mean that there aren't other files or things being hosted on this web server. Without any other link to them other than the silly Jeffrey GIF, we could try and brute force them or scan for them. So I'll go ahead and do that. I'll kick off Nikto, and I'll use tack H, not with the flag, but with the IP address. And you have to specify the HTTP schema if you want to use this. So 10.10.22... And I will tee that out to a nikto.log file so I can save the record of it. I'll also create another terminal. And let's run durbuster or gobuster that I like to run because it's based off the command line. We'll run gobuster in dir mode and we'll specify the URL with tack u. Again, noting the HTTP schema 10.10.202, or sorry, 22. And then we'll specify the word list that we want to use with tack w. This is going to give it the list of locations that it will try and brute force and scan and find. So I actually will use the durbuster list. That's the directory list, lowercase medium. And I just have that saved in my op directory so I could fire that off. If I hit enter on this, gobuster will go do its thing. And it found actually a WordPress server, which is interesting. Okay, we could, I suppose, go check that out. We'll hop over on 10.10.22. And now we have Jeffrey's blog, which is just another WordPress site. Okay, interesting. We could probably do some other enumeration, like using WP scan or other command line tools to look for this stuff. Um, let's see if there's anything else maybe that Nikto had found. Also, we can't forget we do have one other port that we should access. If we go to that 58,008, we can open this up in our web browser, although we aren't sure if that's what it's going to return with. We could just use netcat or something like a socket to connect to it. But opening up in our web browser, we see this butterfly thing that looks like it is connecting to the machine and offering like a login prompt here. So if I had credentials, probably I would be able to try and log in. I'm just guessing root and tour, but okay, no, that looks like that's wrong. So <laughs> that's not going to let me in, but that's good to know. Okay. If we had credentials, maybe we could access this machine in a different way, taking advantage of that port. So let's go check out more of our Nikto and Durbuster scans. Looks like Nikto is finding a lot of strange headers. Um, GoBuster down here has actually found PHP my admin. Ooh, and that is worthwhile and interesting to look at. So let's go explore that before we dive into this WordPress. And we just have a simple login for PHP my admin. At this point, again, we don't know credentials. What we could do when we were accessing that butterfly is try to just guess some common or default or, or weak credentials, username and password pairs. We could brute force this. We could use Hydra or any other tool. And before we do that, which we might still want to do, we could go for the simple low hanging fruit, right? Hacker's always going to go for the path of least resistance. If it's a default or super duper common password and username, well, we're not going to try and break through the window if you just left your front door unlocked. So let's try admin and admin as a simple username and password and that fails. Okay. Username and admin and password admin is going to give us an access denied. Let's try admin password. Ooh, that looked like it worked. Okay. So now we're logged into PHP my admin. We have a lot of information over on the side here for the database. It looks like we are running Jeffrey, right? Uh, MySQL server. And that's what PHP my admin is going to help work with. That's the kind of purpose of that utility. We also see the user here, and we've got this interesting marquee going on. Oh, and there's also a flag here. I see storm CTF 
Learners, Net, Jeffrey, and I cannot easily see that. So let's, again, right click to view the page source or hit Control U. Um, there's a lot of stuff in here, so I'm just gonna search for what we know that key is. Let's storm CTF, I hit Control F on my keyboard here. And there we go, there is our flag, and we can copy that and go ahead and paste that in on the scoreboard. Jeffrey two for 200 points, slap that in right there, and there are our point values. Great, what was that marquee saying? It says, Aldous quit using the admin account we removed the permissions and we saved your password at var text. Ah, okay. That's good to know. Can we access var text? Um, we can't like go to that in the web browser, can we? If I just try to go to aldus.txt, no, that doesn't work. So looking at a web server, right? A web server is often configured with like their document root or where in the local server file system are all these files and folders going to be stored that the web server will be able to actually serve and, and give to, to clients. Um, typically for Apache, that is set up, that document root is configured to be var www.html and that's a folder. So trying to access files above that or, or in different locations other than that on the file system, we won't be able to access them unless we had some sort of vulnerability. If there were some means to be able to access other files on that web server's file system. A really, really good technique that you can use to do this is by abusing local file occlusion. Local file inclusion is a vulnerability though, so we have to be able to see if maybe the services that we're working with or what we found on this web server have that software flaw and are vulnerable to that technique of local file inclusion. So we know though that we're working with PHP My Admin and it is just gonna outright tell us its version number and version information. Looks like we're working with 4.8.1, neat. With that information, knowing the software name and the software version number, we could probably do some research. We could do our hacker homework, right? And go see if there are any known public vulnerabilities or exploits or kind of off the shelf, like attack scripts and code we could use to take advantage of this software. Let's do that. I'm gonna hop over to my terminal one more time. And I don't think we need GoBuster or Nito here because we've got some decent pathway, or pathways or avenues we could look down. So let's use SearchSploit, which will comb through the ExploitDB or exploit database you can find online. And we'll see if there are any known public vulnerabilities for this sort of thing. We'll search for, again, just passing in arguments and specifying the software name and version number, what we know here, PHP my admin, and that should be 4.8.1. Now, if I search for that, I do see PHP my admin 4.8.1 with an authenticated local fill. So that sounds kind of interesting. I'll zoom out here so search exploit can actually include the proper title. <laughs> and it says, okay, we do have local file inclusion. Uh, we're given a path that we could go ahead and use. Search exploit will allow us to simply examine here we know we're authenticated already because we were able to log in as the admin user with the password password. So let's use search exploit and let's use tack X to examine and pass in this path that it's returned to us. X will just simply let us view the exploit. And since it's like a dot text file, it might just be general information or a description or like a little blog post or article explaining what this vulnerability is. If it were something like a .c or a .py or any other file extension for normally executable code, then we can assume, hey, okay, that's an already built out exploit. Let's just take a look at what this .txt file might include here. It says, the latest version downloaded from the official website, the file name is php 4.8.1 all languages.zip. The problem appears in index.php. If you were taking a look at the source code, you could find the issue in these source lines and line 61 contains an include request target. If you see include within PHP and it's not sanitized or it's not kind of cleaned up to validate against user input, the user could supply something a little bit more malicious and do some more damage with that. Include, again, without any clean parameters could offer local file inclusion if we were to bypass the 55 to 59 restrictions that follow on those source code lines. 
Line 57 restricts the target parameter has to begin with index, I think if that's what that explains. Line 57 restricts the target parameter from beginning with index. Okay, so yeah, we can't just simply include index at the very, very start. Line 58, limit the target parameter cannot appear within target blacklist. The target blacklist definition, and that's a variable here, that's on these lines that's still, again, found on the source code. As long as the target parameter is not import.php or export.php, the last limit is core check page validity on the request that we've specified with that target parameter. We could check that out, and that just explains that, okay, all that's doing is using URL decode, and that's another function that'll be able to kind of process the URL encoding representation of stuff. So normally if you were to try and pass like a pound symbol or that little hashtag, the Octothorpe, um, that might mean an anchor in HTML or like a specific link on a page that you might be trying to reference. So if you wanna pass that as real data, you will URL encode that with a percent sign and sort of its hex representation. Sometimes that can be kind of manipulated because you could encode the encoding and trick some programs that work with this. So in this case, we can see the payload here is twice or double encoding that percent sign technique. Again, the percent 25 is gonna actually evaluate to a percent sign. And then the 3F that's left over will access, okay, maybe a, a dot dot or a forward slash or whatever that might specifically be. We can bypass the validation. So we're given an example payload here where they're using some proof of concept address with PHP my admin going to index.php supplying this target value. And they're using dbsql.php. That's just going to act as kind of a dummy because we know it can't be that import or export.php from what we read above. And then we'll try to climb the file system. We're gonna use a forward slash and a dot dot to move up the parent directory. And we'll keep moving up and up until we hopefully eventually reach the root of the file system. That will allow us to climb to any file that we might want within the file system, like var dub 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 all this dot text, which we know we have credentials stored. So let's try and copy this payload here we know we're going to PHP my admin with an index.php target and we'll climb up. They're gonna simply be using a Windows winInit.ini file, but we know that we could try and get to var aldis.txt. So let's remove all of those Windows notions there and let's just get to var aldis.txt in our URL. And there we go. It says, all this, this is a really insecure way to store your password. So we encoded it so that no one can ever get it without knowing how to decode it. Your encoded password is simply this. Okay. This looks like base 64 encoding. And the way that I know that is just kind of, I guess, experience and gaining familiarity with it. Uh, when I notice a random assortment of capital letters and lowercase letters and some numbers thrown in, especially uh, you, you gain an eye for it and noting that that is base 64 encoding. Another incredible telltale is the fact that these equal signs are included at the end. So base 64, that encoding scheme always have to, has to result in a multiple of four in length. So if the regular encoding scheme, what it tries to do to operate on that data, represent it in a different way, if it doesn't end in a multiple of four in length, it'll add on these equal signs as padding so that the final representation does reach a multiple of four in length. So whenever you see these equal signs, that's base 64 padding, and that might be a really good indicator that, hey, this is base 64. So let's go ahead and decode it. I will grab that and copy and paste it, throw it on the command line here. And I will base64 tag D, but I will need to supply what I actually want into the program to be decoded. So I'm gonna echo right before I run that command, echo grab this line on standard output, and then pipe that into base64 minus D to decode it. Looks like I see, get him to the Greek in lead speak. So now we've got some credentials here. Let's just take note of this. I'll say uh, nano creds dot text. Aldis, that user, assuming is a user, right? And he has this password, get him to the Greek. Now, we potentially have credentials. 
So we could try and log in with that butterfly server, the port that we saw on 58,008, or we also know that there is SSH accessible. Let's SSH and log into it. I'm gonna do that with Pwncat because I really like Pwncat. Um, I will open a, another terminal here and I'll move to git Pwncat, which I just have cloned and downloaded. I'm gonna git pull to make sure there are any other changes. I can grab them and download them now. Um, looks like I'm already up to date, so I can activate my virtual environment. I will source environment bin activate. Now I'm in the Pwncat virtual environment. And I can simply run Python tag M, specify a module, I'll use Pwncat because that operates as a module. And then I will specify the SSH like syntax. I'll specify Aldus at 10, 10, 22. That should prompt me for a password. So I will pass in the password that we have. I had that copied and pasted, and now Pwncat can connect. So that was the correct password. Awesome. So Pwncat is great because it gives us just a little shell that we can bump around and, and use, um, either working as a netcat handle to get a reverse shell or connect to a bind shell or SSH in this case. And now we can move into that home directory as that user. I see that there is a flag.txt file there. I'll check the permissions on that. Looks like that flag.txt is owned by Aldus or our current user. So I could simply cat flag.txt. And there we go. Now we have that flag number three. Go ahead and paste that in. Perfect. And let's get back to the box and start to do some more enumeration because right now we're acting as this Aldus user, but that is likely a low privilege user and we wanna fully compromise this machine. We wanna get the root user or root privileges and access. So we'll try to look for a privilege escalation vector. We could enumerate, do our homework, do some research, try to find any misconfigurations on this box to be able to do that. Pwncat will automate that. You could also just run linpeas or some like scripts and automated tools that might help you look for privilege escalation vectors. We could go ahead and run, if we mark linpeas as executable, we could dot slash and run linpeas. Or if that wasn't already on the box, we could try and upload it and bring it in there. In our case, we'll let Pwncat do all the work. So I hit control D to just hop to a local terminal, which will give me access to control and automate the victim or what I'm connected into with some other scripts. We could run some specific commands like enumerate.gather, and that will simply look for all of the things that Linpeas might look for, but do it through Pwncat. So Pwncat can be smart and kind of know and understand how it could leverage and take advantage of the things that it finds. There is a lot of data here, but if I were to run that enumerate.gather and understand what that might be running, I can see the results here. Okay, it's that Ubuntu server that we saw, specific version number 1604. Looks like where are some file systems mounted. We have potential passwords found in different file system locations, and there is a lot that might very well be false positives. It's kind of hard to find what could be a password and what might not be. We could check ASLR or address space layout randomization. Apparently that is enabled. We could see the running processes and who's running them, what process ID and what command was used to start them, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we could also see some interesting pseudo rules or configurations that will allow us to run commands as root or that super user. Super user do or pseudo allows us to run those. That user Aldus that we're running as can run find as any user on this machine without a password. That's awesome. We could probably take advantage of that. That looks like a really good privilege escalation vector. There are other potential things that enumerate.gather will find for us, like the host name, network interfaces, set SUID or SUID binaries that could be run and take the privileges temporarily of another user. An old version of sudo, maybe potentially this is dirty cowable for a kernel exploit, et cetera, et cetera, and cron tabs. So that was great. We had Pwncat do our enumeration that Linpeas could have done, or we could just do it manually with like a find tack perm 4000 to find set UID binaries. Or in the case of the sudo command, you could use sudo tack L to list, to list the potential sudo commands you could run as root. In this case, no password, we can run find. Now, 
Find is a built-in program on Linux systems that we could abuse to actually gain a shell. And if we can run that as root, we can gain a shell as root. We could compromise this machine. You typically can do that with a good resource from GTFO bins. And if I were to simply Google a GTFO bins, that is a great resource that it's a curated list of Unix binaries that can be exploited and attacked to potentially elevate your privileges or do anything else. You could search for whatever binary you might be working with. In our case, we know we're looking for find, so I'll type that in. And we can see, hey, find can be used to execute and break out of a restricted environment by just spawning a simple shell. And this is the syntax that we could use to do that. There's the command and the arguments, and that's passed along. You could do this with a set UID, or you could do it with sudo, and sudo is the avenue that we know we want to use because this machine has that configuration. So we could just simply run that command, and we could get a shell. Slap it in. And looks like I'm root. If I run who am I, I'm root. And we can see that reflected in our prompt. Pwncat looks like it's kind of failing trying to figure out how to uh, properly interpret the prompt here. But let me show you how this is really cool because GTFO bins is a like functionality that Pwncat knows and understands just as well. So if I were to again, hop back to the local prompt and let Pwncat run escalate.auto, it could try and figure out what potential routes it knows that it can abuse to get pseudo permissions or privilege escalate to a different user. Maybe some lateral escalation move to a different low privilege user or follow down a chain to eventually get root. That's kind of neat and that's kind of cool. Pwncat just knows how to do this. If it finds a, a GTFO bin and it knows how to execute it, it can just get the shell. So let's try to exec and run that same GTFO bin syntax. And now we have gotten a shell as root. If I were to move out of this pwncat prompt, you can see, hey, now I'm the root user. I'll run who am I one more time. I am in fact root. So pwncat just did it for us. That was kind of awesome. That's kind of great. You could just simply get on this box with pwncat, run escalate.auto, exec, and then you root. Very nice. Very, very nice. Um, I showed you that to denote the diff different ways to go about this uh, kind of the manual way and the automated way with Pwncat. Um, let's go ahead and grab that root flag. It still thinks that my home directory is home aldus. So if I just simply were to type CD, it would bring me there. But I know that the root directory, home directory is slash root. So because I'm the root user, because I've compromised this box, I can now go ahead and just hop in that directory. I can cat out the flag.txt that is present in there. And there we go. I have Jeffrey4 and I have fully compromised this machine. I'll go ahead and submit that for 400 points. And this Jeffrey box can be done. Awesome. So that was fun. That was a, that was a blast. There was a lot to uh, work through there. Some good, simple stuff. Um, if you have any interest in how Pwncat does that, Pwncat has a big, long configuration file that is figuring out what it can do with these GTFO bins, right? So it's, I believe, in the data directory of not just Pwncat itself, but in the Pwncat module. So you'll move into Pwncat, Pwncat, and then data. Then you'll find a file or GTFO bins.json. And I'll open this up here. But this is minified and compressed. So let's try and make that a little bit more readable. I'll use JQ to process that GTFO bins.json. Uh, I think I need to cat that out and then just pass it into JQ for a standard input. Uh, and there we go. Now I have a ton of output and I will actually copy and paste that in my clipboard with xclip. Um, can I JQ period? There we go. Awesome. Now I will move that into my sublime text text editor and mark the syntax as JSON so I can get some good syntax highlighting. And you can see all of these different types of commands that could be able to actually execute different capabilities like writing a file or reading a file or gaining a shell. If I were to look for that find command, you can see 
okay, it has an understanding of how to get a shell with the payload supplying these specific arguments that you saw in GTFO bins, that online resource. You could also try and do unique things like read or write or all of these. And this is obviously a very, very long file. There is support for all the different GTFO bins that the GTFO bins website knows at the moment. Kind of cool, kind of neat. Okay, that is uh, enough of a safari ride. I, I hope that was fun. I hope we had a good time exploring that Jeffrey box and cruising through. One of the first simple, again, it's meant to be beginner friendly. It's meant to be kind of handholding. It's meant to be something for you to learn from in the guide point security capture the flag exercise. So I hope you will join me in the later videos where we showcase more of these different boxes and the challenges that we can work through. And when guide point security does this again next month for another week long capture the flag event you'll jump in you'll play you'll poke around and practice and sharpen your skills because that's what this is all about so it's been a long video but i want to showcase some cool stuff here thanks so much for watching everybody i'll see you in the next video take care With the